Children learn through play. All children develop at different rates. Children with visual impairment are no different. They learn by doing. Parents are the ones who can do the most to help their child, but collaborative working among families, early year centres, nurseries and school will make a significant contribution. In producing this DVD, we aim to guide children and their families towards confidence and independence. This DVD shows many examples of how young children with visual impairment are provided with opportunity and encouragement to develop their skills. The filming takes place in a range of situations and the film team are indebted to the young children, their families, teachers and other professionals who have allowed us to come into their homes, playgroups and nurseries to produce this DVD. We hope it will be a useful resource for families and those who work with them. Zara Sensory Baby Class Zara is experiencing a multi-sensory approach in a social setting with security from the close physical presence of her parents. Zara is lying on her back on a mat, surrounded by other babies and their parents. Zara's mum is holding both her hands and moving them alternately up and down to the ticking of the clock. Zara is sitting with her dad, feeling some fleecy fabric. And every so often we're going to stop her work to explore the different features. So sing along if you know the words to this song. Zara's mum is supporting her to sit and bounce on a ball in time to the music. Hashim. This clip illustrates the importance of introducing a toy to provide stimulation and then allowing the child himself time to explore. Best of all is personal and physical contact. Note how Hashim stills to listen to his sister and then responds with movement, vocalisation and joy. People are talking off camera. Hashim is supported in his grandmother's lap. With Hashim's right hand on the ball under hers, his grandmother shakes a rattle ball on his chest. Hashim then lifts it up and down from his waist to his chin himself. Now Hashim is lying on his back on a mat on the floor. The rattle ball is shaken at his right side. He turns his head towards it and reaches up to it with his right hand. When the adult lets go, it drops from his fingers. When a toy is introduced, plenty of time is needed to explore it. A hand rattle is shaken by his right side and then it touches his hand. Hashim puts his fingers through it and takes it. He shakes it slowly and is helped to do it more vigorously. He smiles and vocalises. He turns his head towards the voice. Wow, wow, good boy, can I shake? Yay, good boy, that's lovely. Wow, that was that was well done. Give it a shake, give it a shake. You're going to give it a shake? Go on, go on. Give it a shake. Give it a shake. Good boy, that's nice. Good boy, did you like that? Is it good? That's nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
give it that shake again. Wow, well done. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Cool. Notice how he responds to the arrival of his sister. Hashim's sister comes and kneels beside him. She tickles him with her hair and kisses him. Hashim vocalizes, moves his arm and briefly rolls onto his right side towards his sister, lifting his left shoulder right off the mat before rolling back onto his back. <laughs> The sister then puts her arms round him and sings to him. Hashim stills and listens. Out came the sunshine and dried the full rain. So in Simensi spider climbing up the spout. Most children enjoy close physical contact. Then she tickles him again with her hair. She rubs her head on his tummy. Hashim smiles and giggles. Is that good? Now he's good mood. Windsor Park Playgroup. In a darkened room, Finlay is about to use his residual vision to look at the lights. A quiet environment without visual clutter enables a child to focus. In this playgroup, children have opportunities for both individual attention and being part of a group. Notice the importance of good position for maximising use of vision and attention. Being able to socialise is crucial for both children and parents. Finley works best when there is one single stimulus. Finley is supported to sit up close to an infinity tunnel. The lights inside it change colour as his teacher taps it. His eyes are wide open and he is looking right at the coloured lights. As well as individual attention, children and parents benefit from being part of a group. Finley and Erin are lying close together on a mat on the floor. Other toddlers and parents are playing and chatting nearby. Erin is holding a ball rattle. She lifts it up and down and it makes a noise. Good positioning maximises use of vision and attention. Seven toddlers are sitting supported by their mums on the floor with their teacher for circle time. They sing and sign together. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Bye-bye. It's time to say bye-bye. It's time 
and to say bye-bye. Bye-bye, Ellen. Bye-bye, Ellen. It's time to say bye-bye. The Royal Blind School Playgroup Bringing things to Eva stimulates her vision and so helps to develop her muscles as she tracks or reaches out for the toy. Comfortable positioning and accessibility are important. Ava is lying on her back. Her mum stretches out Ava's right arm and jiggles it to assist her to find the sensory bead curtain next to her. Ava explores it independently with her right hand. She turns her head to look at it. Repositioning can help develop a weaker side. Ava has been turned onto her tummy. The bead curtain is shaken at her back. She pulls up her knee and tries to turn towards it. Ava is now lying on her right side and is being facilitated by mum to play with the curtain. She has a big smile. Hanging objects in a small space enables a blind or visually impaired child to find them. Ava is lying in a little room. There are several items hanging on elastic that she can encounter as she moves her arms and legs and sides of different textures that she can feel. It's not, not as good as that one. Um, my husband's dad put some pipe and things together and drilled some holes and it's all black. Like The idea was to try and, for her eyes, um, made the perspex like all black. But this is a really good tactile one. Um, and we've just like hung sort of contrast and things, but I don't know, she's not quite as keen on it as what she has on this one. <laughs> she really likes that graph bit. Mm -hmm. She was so she, she does. She. And the hands open up nicely to it as well. Multisensory experiences encourage exploration. Ava is lying on a foil space blanket. It makes a lot of noise as she moves. Just above her are some bells, which she encounters now and again when she moves. She focuses on the bells and then smiles and vocalises. Lights in a dark room can stimulate visual attention. Ava is lying in a dark room with fibre optic lights and a disco ball. She turns towards the sound of the disco ball rotating. She focuses on the lights and then she reaches out and connects with the ball and vocalises. Developing tracking skills and head control. Ava is sitting up, supported by mum's hand on her head and by holding onto her teacher's hands. Mum shows her a squeaky ball. 
the sound grabs her attention. Ava cannot look and maintain this position. She sinks in the middle. She is given more support around her trunk. Then she focuses on the ball, gives a big smile and follows it by moving her head. Look, I can do it myself. Ava is lying on her back in a play tunnel. At a verbal prompt from mum, she moves her hand above her head and presses a switch to activate star lights in the tunnel. Although McKaylin was initially very passive, developing confidence through close personal contact has encouraged him to explore and find out about the world around him. Some of the best toys are simple everyday objects. Michaelin is sitting on his nursery nurse's knees facing her. He is rocking to and fro and flexing a tin lid on her chest. A resonance board is a good place to play to get lots of sensory feedback. Michaelin is lying on his back on a resonance board with metal bowls, a textured ball, castanets, beads and plastic tubes around him. He moves his hands around to find interesting objects. Michaelin is sitting up on the resonance board. He is making sounds by moving some metal beads around the wood. Messy plea. Michaelin is seated with a tray on his chair. He is exploring jelly and cornflour paste with his hands and feet. It is very messy. Clever boy, that's just right. I never thought of jelly as a play. I've done cornflour gloop and we do water, but spaghetti looks quite cute as well. Cause and effect. Listen to what I can do. Michaelin is playing with a sound mat. Different areas of the mat produce different sounds. Hydropool is a wonderful place to communicate. Michaelin and his teacher are communicating by taking turns to tap rhythms on a large, empty plastic water bottle 
floating in the hydro pool. A warm bath works well too. This is lots of fun. Michaelin is being facilitated to bang vigorously on a large textured physio ball. He has a big smile on his face. <laughs> Emma. Hearing and touch are very significant for a child with a visual impairment. This motivation of sound and or texture encourages the use of vision. It is important to both encourage and allow children to do things for themselves. Selecting the right toys provides the stimulus to do this. A large bubble wand is being waved around. Emma jumps up and reaches out to try and catch the bubbles. Sound motivates and draws visual attention to details. Emma runs over to her mum to show her a rain stick. Her mum turns it up and together they listen to and watch the beads running down inside it. When Emma turns it slowly, it makes a funny noise. <laughs> That's lovely. Look, you see all these bubbles, right? You see them? You see them? They're quite small, they're quite hard to see. That's a funny noise. <laughs> <laughs> the ball ladder encourages Emma to track movement with her eyes. Emma drops a ball onto a frame. She moves her head from side to side as she watches it zigzag down to the floor. Oh, that's a good colour, that one, isn't it? That's like... Emma lifts the different parts of a mirrored chime about and names the colours. This game promotes an awareness of space and position. Emma is playing a fabric skittle game. At first, she bowls the ball wide of the skittles. Then, she slows down, moves nearer, and is able to bowl the ball straight at the skittles and knock them over. Emma is doing a transport puzzle. When the pieces are correctly placed, she receives a sound reward. Dominic is testing Emma's peripheral vision. He moves a light up butterfly towards her and Emma raises her hand when it comes into her field of vision. Tactile toys encourage exploration. Emma opens a toy house and finds a squidgy koosh ball. When it is dropped, it lights up. <laughs> Is it squidgy? Look! <laughs> oh, look at it. It's a little spiky. 
It looks spiky, but is it is it hard or is it soft? Don't bite it. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a spongy balloon. There's a bit in it that if you press it, it lights up. Can you find it? If you like drop it, I think. Emma, what happens if you hold above your head and drop it on the ground? Is it what big? happens? Like? Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. Kaelin. In both low and high tech toys, it is sound that stimulates Kaelin's curiosity and encourages him to use his vision. It is important to get down on the floor and play with your child at his own level. Note how Kaelin's mum allows him space to find out how to fit the block on the train by himself. Low tech. Kaelin and his mum are sitting on the floor. They post balls into parallel curving plastic tubes. Kellen looks down at the tubes. He then bends his body, tilts his head to the right, and puts his face close to them and watches the balls go down. Mum allows Kellen space and time to problem solve. Kellen is building up a block train. He has to fit shapes onto a row of posts on wheeled carriages to make the train. Helen and his mum are putting facial features on to make up a Mr. Potato Head. Right, I put feet on. Do you want to put his hat on? Nice. That's a lovely toy. <laughs> Kilo really likes it as well. Do you know, and also because the facial features are so obvious as well, I think that's probably quite good. Yeah. And he needs a moustache. High take. Good. It was the Leap Pad Explorer one because it's got um, it's got like an app in it called Mr Pencil. Uh -huh. So you just would spend ages writing the alphabet. So it would do capital A and small case A, and you would sit and do that. So quite early on, can learn to write sort of you know, letters. You are a good time for your talent. But another favourite for Ken actually on, was on it's on the fridge, but it's um it's like an alphabet one, but there's That's space so for three good. letters. So you put a letter in and it does, you know, says what the, the letter is, but you can spell words and it asks you then to find the letters on the fridge to spell like cat or dog. So again, it's like, you know, it's speaking to him and it's, you know, giving him the reaction, you know, he gets it right. Mm -hmm. But because it's alphabet, he, he loves the letters. Aaron. All the children in this DVD have visual impairments, but above all, they are children and they need to play. Aaron is having fun at the playground with his two sisters, Anna and Blythe. They are swinging him on a lie-out circle swing. Aaron is lying in the swing, wriggling his body, kicking his legs and blowing bubbles with a great big smile on his face. Now he is going down the slide with Blythe. Anna catches them at the bottom. Blythe and Anna push Aaron on a sitting swing. He has a great big smile on his face. Aaron's my little brother and I do anything for him. Um, when Zara was born, we first found out that she had a visual impairment. To be honest, neither of us really thought about it that much. I think because I've had a visual impairment all my life, we just we never really thought about what would be the reality. And it's only now that she's well three, four months, so we're actually beginning to think what the impact will be for her growing up. We kind of got an idea in the hospital, didn't we, that something wasn't 
quite right because they kept on checking out their eyes and it was quite, um, um, I don't know, kept on happening, didn't it? They kept, this guy kept, kept on going and checking her and Kelly thought it was, she was getting a, but it's just because I've got a visual impairment, it doesn't mean that my, my kid. Yeah, you, you didn't think it was hereditary, Kelly, did you? No, no. no I had no idea, I was and, always um, told it wasn't. But good. actually, there was superb and they did identify something and it was, I, I, I find myself being a bit too relaxed about it, to yeah, be honest. Yeah, me right. too. I think and I don't know whether, I'm assuming that's... Is that just purely because you've always been with Kelly and you've always accepted Kelly's vision? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think that's a... It's not an issue for I don't you. I think that's an issue. And yeah. I'm actually in some ways quite looking forward to it. Because, um, I don't know, I just love it a bit. And yeah. I'm looking forward to involving as much as you can. Is there a, a need for you to be more involved with Zara compared to your other daughter? I think we notice it now a little bit, to be honest. Um, now that she's much more aware of things and she's moving about more and different things, we're aware that we need to stimulate our eyes a little bit more and try and encourage her to um, move about and can experience the world differently. Like, explore the explore world. Explore the world, absolutely explore the world. And we weren't really thinking about that and that, to be honest, is probably more of our concerns now. We have, we're much more aware that we need to allow her to explore, to, to see different things, to try and stimulate her vision of what she's got and also to use other senses, touch and yeah. hearing and all that kind of thing. So when you're looking at resources or toys and things like that for the house, do you, do you tend to stick to mainstream toys or as you're picking and choosing toys, are you always aware of will she be able to see that? Will that stimulate her that wee bit more? I think, yeah, I think there's no reason why you necessarily have to use specialised toys. I think you just need to use a bit of common sense and try and identify ones that um, would be more suitable for Zara in the sense that she can perhaps go up closer to it or, or feel it better or bright colours or you know colours yeah, yeah things like that. So there's no there's no real need to identify anything you know, specific. In fact, mm -hmm. it's funny it's just finding what, what works for her because we were at I was at the class a few weeks ago with the baby sensory class and one of the things that she loved was a silver foil blanket. Mm -hmm. It's the noise and the texture of it. just wanted you to say a few words, if you don't mind, about um, the benefits to you and Ava of coming to the early years of the Anna Play Group. Yeah, well, it's just been a huge help having somewhere to go where other mums teach us can tend to relate to what, what we've went through or are going through. I've got a lot of good ideas from from what you had had here, yeah, the little rooms, um, the all the black and white things going right yeah. back to the very beginning there, and um, just playing black and white things. And um, it was nice to see how Ava responded to those yeah. things. For certain, yeah. yeah, she was content to play in those situations when it was right for her, and she felt yeah confident. Yeah, so, sound sound such a huge a huge thing in Ava's life. Um, but getting that balance, if you go what I found is if you're trying to take in a tiny regular play group, so it was the noise and the, the, the other children and, and the noise of their toys and things like that. If I wasn't able to block out any background noise right back in the very the very beginning, sort of our first year of life, everything just was, because of our vision loss, our other senses is heightened, therefore sounds and things just trigger off a startle reflex and... Mm -hmm. um, make her really, really quite upset. So coming here, having the quietness, um, it meant that I could play her familiar sounds, bring her along her familiar toys, and try and incorporate that with the ideas that you had for a vision of things. Yeah. Um, and slowly but surely, sort of, was still trying really hard to work, work, get away from the sounds, um, and just work towards the vision. But we you know, now we we'll do things with vision, but keep the sounds still in the background, the, the calming me down encouraging her to, to look at things and feel for things and she came on quite nicely with that um, so it's this, this place has, has been great I think the main, main two reasons is getting getting me out and um, getting Ava out um, and getting ideas getting a lot of useful ideas that we can take away back home with us and um, you know, we, we have, we've, we've done, we've done our century room at home for and then we're using all the old, good ideas, and, 
and then it gives us someone where I can now was worked up to be able to independently play quite well ourselves for you know in a snap to an hour which is, is huge and um, it's, it's huge because she just she couldn't she was totally dependent on me being her hands and yeah um you know now we should say um, a vision I think is, is, is coming on great although it's, it's so hard to tell but it does vision because of um because of the cerebral palsy and there's nothing at all wrong with it as eyes it's just the uh, the, the signals don't get to the brain, um, so therefore she can't process what she's seeing here. Um, it's hard to work out. It's hard, so it's hard to work out. So getting any kind of assessments on what Eva's vision is doing is, is is proven almost impossible because there's just no way of actually you knowing how far she can see, how much she can see, because although she maybe can see it, she can't always demonstrate that she can see it. Um, but it's, um, it's definitely, I can see that it's definitely improving, and um, that's all we come up for, it's just improvements. So, yes. Thank you very much. So when um, was it nursery and things, well, how did you engage with the nursery and speak to them to make sure that they knew and understood the site was? Um, well, uh, we had a meeting with nursery um, to make sure they, understand, they understood and the visual impairment teacher had also went in and made suggestions for kind of things that they could do. Mm -hmm. um, they got like yellow paint painted on the stairs and contrasting colours because um, it actually goes between two rooms. A lot of contrasting colours or, or like tied around the post that's in the middle of the room things like that. Okay. So, and what I'm always kind of like letting them know a lot of stuff. Um, if of course she wears contact lenses, so her contacts are out, if she's got a, a facet glasses on, um, if she's had sore eyes, or um, if anybody in her she's got an eye infection, you have to let me know because she's not allowed her, if she gets it, she's not allowed her contacts in, okay. things like that. I think you have to be on top of it. Because if you didn't do, if you didn't tell them, or if you didn't, they just. So do you feel do you have a good strong working partnership with the nursing and then obviously school as well? Is that really important? Yeah. Yeah. So if you had one thing to say to other parents, what would it be about having a child with a visual impairment? Um, I don't know actually. You do, it, it, is a, it obviously is a worry to start with, but then you just think, well, you get on that. There's no one really any different mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, bubbly outgoing and we just kind of deal with it as, as we have to yeah we just have to adjust mm -hmm. and just kind of look into things and see what's the best to do mm -hmm. so and would you one toy what's a what's a favorite toy do you think that you um, maybe suggest that all different balls spiky thing that was in there yeah we had a couple of them in the house she mm. loves them because mm. they like they light up and they're squishy, squishy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she loves them um trying to think torches we've got a lot of torches mm -hmm. just lying, lying around okay. everywhere and uh, just kind of lights mm -hmm. just what and now that she's a wee bit older she's more playing with outside on the trampoline or She's just learnt to ride her bike, so she's she's going on a bike. Mm -hmm. so bike that, stabilizers. That's fantastic. Are you riding a bike? Are you school yourself? That's wow. Good. So would you say in the early stages it's important possible to use toys which are encouraging the use of vision, mm -hmm. but the older they get, it's more mainstream? Mm -hmm. I, I would say more kind of contrast and colours and getting them to bring their vision on when they're when they're near, but now that she's a wee bit older. She plays with her sister and just play with standard toys, don't you? Well, hi, I'm an advocacy worker. I work for a charity who uh, supports parents of children with additional needs. But I'm also a parent of a child who has a severe visual impairment and also other complex needs as well. I'm just call Jessica. Um, I think when Jessica was first born, and obviously we got the diagnosis pretty quickly, it was just a total shock. Um, you know, 
absolutely unexpected because everything had been fine and it was just really kind of knocked knocked us sideways. Um, and I think it's very difficult at that time to kind of know how the future is going to pan out, all the things that you thought were going to happen, you know, that you've kind of had to let go of those. So it's a very difficult time and also you're not, you've kind of been plunged into a world that you're not aware of what support is available, what you can access, what's out there and and most of your friends probably aren't in a similar situation to the situation that you're in so it's very difficult to, to know where to turn. Um, obviously organisations like the one that I, I work for um, are particularly keen on, on helping children um, and, and parents you know, in, in those early days, because it is the real start of a journey that, that you have to you have to move on. Um, and most of the people who work where I do are parents of children who have additional needs too. Um, so I think I realised quite early on that it was it was essential for me to find out as much as I possibly could. Um, you know, about Jessica's visual impairment, how that was going to impact on her, what that was going to mean for her life, what was available and, and things like that. And so um, I think probably the first port of call, the the community paediatricians were generally quite helpful. They um, would maybe signpost you to organisations. Obviously the internet was a, a great resource as well, although I know that you shouldn't necessarily believe everything that, that you read on there. Um, but I think it, it's very good for giving you ideas. Um, Community nurses, they, they can be great in signposting you to, to organisations that will be able to support you. And then obviously, kind of more national organisations that are available in Scotland can kind of give you very good information or, or signpost you to particular organisations that will be able to support you in your area. Um, but I think for me, one of the most important things is being able to speak to other parents who are in a, a similar situation, particularly with regard to Jessica's visual impairment, because I always knew that that was going to be sort of the the window that she would access everything through. So it, it, it was sort of her learning, had that had to be the focus of her learning to kind of encompass everything else that she had to deal with. So um, speaking to other parents that were a little bit further along the line or, or even just parents that were in a very similar situation, you know, people always knew something that you perhaps didn't know or you could share something with them. And, and I always found that I learnt much more from other parents really than I, than I learned from anybody else because they were in a very similar position and they, they just got it and sometimes you know it can be difficult if you if you're not used to being able to find things out or um, you don't really know where to go but you know there, there is a lot of support out there so you just need to keep at it. Started working with Rosie when she'd have been three years old, but I was aware of it and knew her at points throughout when she was at the nursery from a baby up till she was three, but she came into our room when she was three. I was nervous and apprehensive, but we had the other staff to reassure us on what we were going to do, and there was continuous education available for us. We had lots of resources throughout the nursery with different people coming in working with us, and it was passed on to other staff members through training. We had to work with the child as normal. We had to um, speak to our parents, we had to speak to our um, Elaine who came in to help us with our learning. We had to adapt the room and we explained to the children and through this we had maybe when we had to set out the areas a member of staff would have to take Rosie around if there was any changes she had to use her hands and feel round. Sometimes with different beads or different things on ends of um, desktops, tables, chairs, so she was aware of this. She had There was maybe braille on some of the chairs, so Rosie was aware that that was her chair. Also brought in the opticians for the other children who gave visual aids to let us be aware of how, what depth of her visual impairment was. So they had masks and they came in for training days. We set up the nursery, we had up to, like the opticians ongoing. We had lots of different things. We had all our painting, we had books, um, braille put onto books, and people in to explain to us to do this, both her parents and anybody else that worked along with her. She had buddies within the nursery so the children were very aware and as much as the training but it was a learning process for the children as well because we had to make it very clear and they were very good at helping helping with Rosie so they all knew but without 
been overbearing, they, they were very good at saying, oh no, wait and I'll tell you, oh, it's been changed, Rosie, there's a chair there. So they were very good, they, were, they helped us lots. They were probably better than us at times because they minded. Yeah, I really to that. Because it benefited us because it's, it is scary, but it's, there's nothing, it's just inclusion and it's the unknown that you're actually scared of and when it happens you do it daily. So. Ability to look at uh, how we, how we uh, integrate Rosie's particular needs with, with ongoing child development because every child is the same entitlement to the same thing. Everybody was keen to uh, please Rosie and we as a staff I think had to learn to uh, hold back and recognise what is in her best interest, not what makes it easier for her but what is going to, what is going to pull her on. That's a very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think obviously it's maybe easier or to do things for her mm -hmm. and not let her do them herself because she was so able to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, And it was just about that when to intervene mm -hmm. and the staff knowing when to stand back and allow her to Absolutely. progress through, mm -hmm. um, which w w was the difficult part for the staff about, mm -hmm. you know, stand back, give her time, you know, give her a chance to do it for herself. All in all, it was, it was very, very positive for us as a nursery.